You know, I'd love to just welcome you all again and it's great to have everyone here for the tour and so many sort of neighbours and friends and so on. You know, when Pouring and myself were originally talking about these six areas, we said, wouldn't it be brilliant if we could get a group like this, put them in a bus, and we travel to each of the six areas one by one and we'd be, we could be the first people to do it since the Neolithic. Of course with the Covid we knew that wasn't going to happen. So we said what's the next best thing? We need a magic bus. Um, so this is what we're doing now. We're doing a kind of imaginary tour of these six areas. But we're doing it, what we realised, pouring myself walked out here and we went, God we can actually, from the horizon here, we can actually see Cairns Hill and Knocknaray and Ballygawley and Karakil and Kish and of course probably Neolithic people was that why they chose here they went we can see all of these areas you know wouldn't it be lovely we've been talking about you know world heritage site status for Sligo and uh, in that sort of vision there was an the idea that we'd have six big clusters there's a lot of little dots around but these kind of passage tombs come in clusters and maybe it's a good idea to explain a little bit of the way the structure of it is is envisaged it's just one view of it so you've got Miss Sahal here beside us and out from Miss Sahal about 30 small monuments we are walking among them now and you'll see the little monuments dotting around here some in better conditions than others some of them like across the road really well preserved for the fact that they're here nearly 6,000 years and that would be amazing in itself if that's all we had, over an area of about a square kilometre. But go out then if your giant compass, and the giant compass takes you out six kilometres, and draw a circle around, and you see monuments dotting the horizon everywhere you look. Um, and that's the Kulira, as you know, this is the peninsula of Kulira. In a way, that's the Kulira complex, and I'm going to take you on a trip around some of them. And then my colleagues, Robert, and Austin later will bring you further along that route. But if we were then to get over there uh, into Ballasadere Bay and go up the river, the River Uncheon, it would take you up past Colooney, it would take you up ultimately to the next great complex, that's Carrakeel, which is light coloured in the distance, 22 kilometres away. There again, a great cluster at Carrakeel, 16 monuments or whatever in a small, tight area. And out with your giant compass again, and again, within an area of six kilometres, lots of monuments dotting the horizon again. So those two great centres were what it was envisaged. And in, within them are six big clusters. This place here, Carrowmore, Knocknaray over there, I'm going to talk about in a second. Then over Cairns Hill in Sligo Town, and there would have been originally, we know of at least four monuments that would have existed in the zone where Sligo town uh, area is now. Then over to Ballygawley, and Austin will talk more about Ballygawley in a little while, the four rounded hills there, a number of monuments over in that region around Ballygawley. We have some representatives as well from Ballygawley in that, in that department. Uh, and then we have uh, Carrokeel. Um, we had the Carrokeel gang here earlier on, uh, as there might still be some of them around. And then we have Kish. So those are the six big centres, and it's a question like, for people to, you know, talk about their own experience and everyone that's here has some experience as a child or at different phases in their life seeing these things for the first place and it beginning to sink in the awesome quality of the landscape we live within that's for me personally the same you know I remember the first time seeing Knocknaray for example and Knocknaray is such a distinctive thing that once you've seen it you can't forget it it's like the language of the horizon so as you go around here one of the things that will strike you are these forms and shapes and unforgettable profiles and as i said we'll take you through a few of them knocknare it's not a huge mountain it's like 300 meters or something uh, and on the top of it is that massive unopened passage tomb one of the biggest probably in western europe 60 meters wide at the base 10 meters tall no one's ever opened it this county is distinctive because there's about 10 big monuments not quite as big as that, all of them, some of them, but up to sort of 20 metres in diameter that no one's ever opened. They include the pinnacle on the top of Cache, they include some of the Ballygawley Mountains, the two at Cairns Hill, and, and, and so on and so on. Around Knocknaray at the peak, there are nine other small satellite tombs, much as you have satellite tombs around here. And along the side of the mountain, there are embankments, there are hut sites, there are quarries. It, it was a real playground of the Stone Age. In this period, presumably sometime between 6,000 and 5,000 years ago, when a very, very different cultural group uh, and a cultural milieu was in play in Ireland than what we are familiar with. 
As we travel along the horizon though, there's lots more to see. And as to now there's a little cloud coming in, but under the cloud there, as you go over there, you see the lovely green hills in the distance, and there's a couple of telegraph poles there. If you come up from those telegraph poles, you have Nakalungi, or Knucka Cree, Knucka Cree, and that Knucka Cree is the highest peak in the Ox Mountains, and it's a really strange, alien, boggy, sandy, unfamiliar landscape. It, it's nothing to do directly perhaps with climate change in the immediate sense because we look at photographs from the 1960s and that's still in play then but it certainly is a, is a dangerous place to go if you don't know where you're where you're going if you, if you haven't got a familiarity. There's two cairns there. If we travel along the uh, Ox Mountains a little bit then we'll come to a place where we see the television mast is conveniently positioned for us and uh, the TV mast if you go right from the TV mast you'll see a little dip, there's a sort of a, a distinctive V with a, a rounded hill to the left and a rounded hill to the right. And the rounded hill to the right is Alton Elvik, or the hill of the, of the student, or the cliff of the student. Alt is a, probably a better word, is, 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 is cliff. Um, uh, is another name for one of the townlands that's there. Uh, and the Lecht being the monument or a, 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 a memorial. Um, and along to the right of that again, there's a few other profiles, more easily distinguishable when you get down to Beltra. But those sites there are again cairns. We don't know how old they are. There's a, they're profoundly mysterious places. And just goes to show how little in a way we know of this landscape uh, as long as we're here. If we go left again and we see a very distinctive uh, feature there where you have a little mountain peeping out from behind a dip in the hills. And those of you that's local will all know what that is. That's an Aknashi, two monuments on the top of Aknashi. Uh, Aknashi, a, a very distinctive mountain. As you go west from here and you look, the, 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 the profile changes and you see the, the way that Aknashi plays along that horizon. And to the right of Aknashi is Do More. And Do More, again, you see, the, you get used to looking at the bumps on the top of the hill. There's the, uh, the cairn on the top of Do More. And it's supposed to be that one of the O'Haras was buried there in the, in the medieval times inside of course a monument that would have been already thousands of years old uh, when that man uh, lived. Uh, and one of the things about that area around Dumour is there's a village up there called the Lost Village. There was a man called O'Connor, I think Austin was his name, at one stage came into the visitor centre, a man from Balasadir. I hope the man is still to the good because I'd love to get back to to chatting to him. You know, you sort of miss these opportunities. And the man came in and he started telling us about how there was two families that used to live on the side of that mountain. And in the famine times came, in the middle of the 19th century, the people were buried under cairns. The village is deserted now. You can go in there. And there was a feature on the Slag of Champion last week where a young photographer went in and she got lots of images of that. And you have that sort of feature over there where you see all these cairns that could be from anything from 20 minutes ago back to the Neolithic. There's just that sort of seems to be that that notion that care and building has stopped. Not, not in your life, not certainly in the Ox Mountains. Come to the left of that again and you get another mountain that's cone shaped, but I'm not going to talk about that. Instead of that, I'm going to hand over to my colleague and the organizer of the event this time, uh, who is Dr. Robert Hensey. So I'm going to take over from where Porig left off and I'm going to ask you all to turn around now and you'll see this sort of triangular mountain dead ahead. Can you all see that? It's kind of cone shape, almost like a little volcano. Has everyone got that? That's Crocon, and uh, it's another one of these many sites now in the Ox Mountains. It was excavated many years ago, and it seems the people that built that monument did an unusual thing. It was almost like they took the little peak off the very top and put their monument in there. It's a tiny little monument, and all around that landscape there's a lot of this white quartz and you see veins of it. And we know Neolithic people loved this quartz. They were chipping it out of these veins and mixing it with the remains of their dead. Uh, and then of course later, they were placing it on their monuments and on top of their monuments. So they must have thought it had some special qualities or some, uh, something life-giving about it. These, this mountain range, the Ox Mountains, is much older than the limestone of Knocknaray, at least double the age. Some of it would be three times the age in some places. Um, and I know uh, we've Michael here uh, from North America. And have you ever walked the Appalachian Trail? Uh, afraid not. Afraid not. <laughs> well, has anybody been on the Appalachian Trail? Does anybody know about it? So the whole east coast of the States 
is the Appalachian Trail, this enormous great walk that people walk for months. Um, but if you walk that Appalachian Trail and you think you finished, you haven't. Because this is part of the Appalachian Trail. This is the same mountain range at one time geologically long, long ago was joined up to that mountain range. There's a little sprinkle in Scotland and a little sprinkle in Norway for good luck, but one time long ago this was all part of the, part of the same mountains. So it's an extraordinarily sort of uh, ancient hills and they're so old and so worn down. These are the foothills of those uh, great mountains. So we're going to continue on then and uh, the weather's holding up just about but you can see far in the distance you've got the sort of mountains in the haze in the distance there and you can see uh, Cache and Karakil. Now Porig mentioned two areas that were particularly important. We have this area here in Kulira uh, but the other great area is what we're looking at now. That area down there again full of these kind of monuments. There's about a hundred of these sites spread across the whole county and most of them fit into those two great centres. So the first one, the big humpback, it looks like a big whale. Uh, that's a uh, cache there and you have the pinnacle on the top, uh, the highest passage tomb in the county I think that we, you know, almost certainly a passage tomb, but like Porrick said, it's never been opened. So we have some great treasure for the future there. Who knows what's in it? Very probably art, very probably more human remains. To the right of that you've got the cliffs and the famous caves of Cache uh, and they were formed about a million years before the last glacial period. Water was running through that landscape and ran through this land and made this whole amazing series of caves that we can still visit today. Um, when those caves were excavated they found all kinds of bones, a lot of evidence of people in the Iron Age but some of the bones were particularly old and they found evidence of arctic lemming up there so get your heads around that that's how different this landscape was you know and i don't know people who i'm sure some of you here have walked around in that landscape particularly between uh Keish and karakil and it's just the most mysterious enthralling you know unusual landscape of highs and lows and ups and downs and you can never get it you know enough of it and um, so all those wonderful names were wonderful names like uh, treen moore treen mcmurta uh, Transcraba, all these great names going across, um, is all that uh, uh, whole area of Keish and I said lots of monuments there. But your eye continues then, we're going across those unusual little peaks and hills and then we can see it's like somebody has taken a big bite out of it, you know. Uh, and that U-shaped valley we'll all be familiar if you're driving to the south or you're heading towards it, you're, you're seeing that dead ahead um, uh, on the road. Uh, and that's a defining thing because that shows us where Karakil is. So to the right you have Transcraba, you've got a cairn there that we call Cairn B. We have no idea what uh, Neolithic people call it, they definitely didn't call it Cairn B. We know that for sure. But uh, art was discovered there just over 10 years ago. Um, and that's amazing because it tells us there's still lots to be discovered. People have been walking up and going inside of these monuments for generations. Um, and as Porrick said, these are 6,000 years old. So if you think of your parents, your grandparents, your great grandparents, and do that 400 times, then you're back to when these monuments were built. Um, so it, it's an extraordinary journey and we're sort of part of that journey. And the amazing thing is what we're starting to learn now from the DNA of these people is that um, this Neolithic DNA, we all know that all of us probably on this tour have some of that DNA inside us. Now it might be a very small amount, maybe 5 to 10% or something like that, but these Neolithic people aren't gone, they're actually still here. Uh, and they're inside all of us, so their monuments are here and they're living inside of us. Maybe we're living in their world, you know? Um, so that's it, and we know that from Karakil in particular, um, bones were found there by R.A.S. McAllister. He excavated the site in 1911 with this kind of dream team of scholars. Robert Lloyd Prager, the most famous naturalist in Ireland, a botanist, you know, famous across Europe, the Clear Island Survey, uh, the assistant keeper in the National Museum was there doing work. Alexander's father, the most eminent atomist in Europe, possibly at this time in Cambridge. They get the bones from the sites, they wrap them up, put them in boxes, put those boxes in trains and off to Dublin. And that's what we can see in the report. The bones have left Sligo, uh, you know, ancestors of people here and they've gone to 
Dublin. Um, and we know Alexander worked in the Duckworth Laboratory in Cambridge, and that's where he wanted to analyse the bones. So he did his little bit of work, a report came out in 1912, and then the bones were lost for about 100 years. There was floods, boxes were moved, things were changed, you know, writing on the boxes was changed. And a woman that we know, Colasson Sheridan, was rooting around in the Duckworth Laboratory in 2002, and she saw a little box and it had ink writing on it, and it said, Carrakeel, County Donegal. <laughs> And Alison knew better. She looked through the finds and went, they aren't Donegal, these are finds from Carrakeel. And looked at the notes and the handwriting. And then Poring and myself went back later and we were able to say not only were they from Carrakeel, but we could say those bones came from Cairn F. Those bones came from Cairn E. So we, could, we were able to track them, largely Poring's work really, we were able to track them down precisely to each cairn. And because of that, we're getting loads of information now. So some of the bones, uh, we could see marks on the bones, these fine lines, and we're seeing into the kind of special rituals they had when somebody died, the mortuary rituals. And this may sound a little bit macabre, so prepare yourself, but it seems that some of the bodies that they were dismembered after death. You know, so a very kind of unusual thing. Others, the bodies were burned, and you can imagine the community coming from while. If you've ever been up at Carrakeel on John's Eve and you see the fires going up and how far you can see them from, you need to imagine huge bonfires with huge heat to cremate these bodies, and the community all around, people standing here seeing it, you know. So an extraordinary kind of uh, event to be involved in. But uh, some of these people may have been considered very special in society. And it seems maybe all of these processes were about moving the person into the other world to become an ancestor, to become a guide for the community. Whether the body was cremated or whether they were dismembered, it all ended up in the same thing as bones at the end of the day in their special monuments. So not only have we got their DNA inside us, but we have still have their monuments here with us as well. So that's uh, uh, Karakil and Kesh and that whole second centre that, that Porig mentioned there. Uh, and we're going to continue around now and we're, we're rejoining uh, the Ox Mountain, Sleeve Damp and Ballygawley. But we're going to have to move to another area to talk about that. Austin's going to take over and tell us a bit about the mythology and the Kylock hopefully as well. Okay. You're very welcome here to Listohol. This is the central point of, of Caramore, the focal point of Caramore, but it's also possibly the focal point of uh, Neolithic Sligo as well. The, the dates that came from this particular uh, cemetery here, they give us the, some of the earliest burials in the Neolithic in, in, in Ireland. And uh, when we look across over here at the horizon, we see the Ballygawley Mountains. You can see four very distinctive round top mountains. And if you look closely, you can see a dot on the top of them, a cairn on top of them. The one on the very far right there, just over the trees, that's known as the, the Kalyuk's house, the Kalyuk of Era. Bera, the, the harbinger of winter, she's the, the witch of winter. And you follow that line along here, uh, just beyond the uh, retail park there, right on the top of the hill, right in the centre of the hill, you have Cairn's Hill. One of two uh, very large monuments there on the top of that hill, and they're one of the, the unopened tombs uh, that Porik has talked and spoken about earlier on in the, in, in the tour. Uh, one of the, I think it's the 10 or 11 tombs that we have in County Sligo that have never been opened. And they're, and they're quite large tombs as well. But then when you swing to the, uh, the left of that, just beyond the trees there, it's, 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 it's not visible at the present moment, we have another very interesting uh, site. Uh, the Causedroot Enclosure at Maharaboy. Now this was a structure that was discovered during road construction some 50 to 20 years ago. A causewood enclosure <clears throat> is synonymous with early farming. You find them all over Europe, from as west as Maharaboy right across to, the, uh, the, to Georgia and the Caucasus. It's a huge enclosure, a ditched enclosure, but it's not a continuous ditch, it's a segmented ditch. So you have roadways or causeways coming in from various different directions. But in, the, in one of the ditches there at, at Maharaboy, they found uh, radiocarbon dates, which gives us uh, dates just over 6,000 6, years ago, 6,100 years ago. And it's probably the smoke and gun of the arrival of these people. They were a farming people. They were the first people to come to uh, bring, bring uh, agriculture to Ireland some 6,000 years ago. And they would have migrated from northern France. But ultimately, their origins and their ancestors, their origins was in the Middle East of 10,000 years ago. 
There were the people who pioneered farming, who domesticated cattle and wheat, and they brought this knowledge of farming right across Europe over thousands of years. They came through Anatolia, Turkey. 9,000 years ago, they were in north, northwestern Turkey. Then they move into the Balkans and they take two routes to northwestern Europe from, from there. They move along the Danube and they move along the Mediterranean. But sometime around about 7,000 years ago, those two routes converge on one another in northern France. And it's coincidentally uh, around that time that all this megalithic activity begins. So when they came to Ireland uh, 6,000 years ago, they came with a fully fledged uh, tradition of building these passage tombs. Now, the, the most recent information that we've got uh, about these people is, is from ADNA, ancient DNA. We found that there's a gentleman buried here 5,600 years ago, and he's related to an individual in Newgrange 5,300 years ago. And centuries later, you can still, still see that connection at, at Carrickheel. Uh, the experts believe that there must, must have been some uh, uh, royalty, that they were a special family. Uh, another uh, clue that we get uh, from the, uh, the actual analysis of the bone uh, that gives uh, an idea that they may have been an, an elite is that their, their diet seems to have been much richer than the rest of the people as well. A lot more T-bone steak on the plate than, than the rest of the people were getting. So, you know, this, from this point here we, we get maybe some semblance of how these people thought or how they viewed the world around them and how they interacted with nature and with God. Because this particular tomb we found about 20 years ago has a special alignment. It's aligned towards the mountains here to the, uh, to the east and towards a very particular spot on the mountains. Just beyond the trees there, can you see the, uh, the pole in the field there just beyond the trees? Well, if you come left of that, there's a gradual hollow in the mountain and it looks as though there's two uh, points defining the hollow in the mountain. Well, the sun rises at that point on precisely the 31st of October and again on the 10th of February. And that marks what we know in Ireland from the Gaelic world, we know it as Samhain and Imbolc. Samhain is better known throughout the world today as Halloween. But Samhain marks the beginning of winter. Imbolc is associated with Bridget, St. Bridget. It marks the beginning of spring. And that connection with the Calyuk and Bridget is very, very interesting as well. Because the people here in Sligo in ancient times and up until very recent times, in fact, believe that these mountains here, the Ballygally Mountains, was the embodiment of the Calyuk of Era herself, the Bera, the Witch of Winter. She's believed to be lying there on her back in the landscape. So the round mountain there to the right hand side, which contains the, the Calyuk's house, that's her head. You can see her two breasts, her belly, and her legs spreading out to, towards the east. And the interesting thing is that uh, the sun rises at this point here, in what we call the saddle, on the 31st of October. But it continues its winter journey right across the Ballygally Mountains, right across each of those summits. And on the 21st of December, it rises just to the right of the, the Calyuk's house. And this gives us probably some idea of how the people who lived here many, many thousands of years, how they thought and how they interacted and wh how they believed what, what constituted their cosmos at that, that particular time. And we get a, we're getting a glimpse into that particular uh, view. Now, the other thing which is interesting about these people as well, we, I, I said to you there that we, we, these people brought uh, domestic cattle and, 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 and wheat and crops to, to Ireland 6,000 years ago. But the interesting thing is that some of those crops and uh, animals were domesticated in the Middle East about 10,000 years ago. We believe that all modern cattle in the fields that you see around you here today, they, they spring from about 80 breeding females uh, from the Zagros Mountains of 10,000 years ago. They all have a common ancestry. Horses, for, another, for, for an instance, they seem to have been domesticated on several occasions. We seem to go out and, and get, round up the Mustangs and bring them in and try and, try and break them uh, from time to time. But cattle, cattle have a, a very, very singular origin uh, from, from that area of the, of the Middle East. Um, wheat uh, was brought from uh, probably southeastern Turkey and, and Syria, uh, right across Europe. And the interesting one thing I always find very interesting is that in, among that wheat they brought a very troublesome weed called oats. It was weeds for, for a while, but uh, once they got north of the, the, the Alps, 
they found probably that oats grew very, very well there, where wheat didn't grow quite as well. Uh, oats was domesticated much later than, than wheat. It seems to be domesticated in the Bronze Age. So that gives you a perspective of some of the, the stories and some of the mythology that's associated with the mountains. And as I say, the Ballygawley Mountains are particularly interesting as far as Caramore is concerned. Uh, there's one particular story which I'm going to fi finish off on and it comes from the Scottish tradition and it tells us about the, witch, the, the, the winter, winter witch uh, and, and what, she, what she got up to. Uh, it comes from the Scottish tradition and in, in that tradition it tells us that the Calliuch of Era, the winter witch, that she imprisons Bridget, who is in the ancient times was the, go the goddess of the dawn, uh, she imprisons her in Samhain, at Samhain, at the beginning of winter and that's what brings winter to the world. But in February, Bridget escapes and there's a great battle between the two of them. And uh, in the month of May, Bridget overcomes the witch and Summer returns to the world again. Only for it to start all over again the following, following October, November. Um, I think when you, when you feel that breeze blowing today, one wonders what, what Bridget is doing. <laughs> I think she must have got her COVID cer certificate. I think she got her COVID certificate and she's uh, headed for Spain. <laughs> I'm going to hand you over now to, to Robert to conclude. So we just wanted to say a special big thank you to all of the neighbours and friends here around Caramore for our special Heritage Week tour of the horizon. <laughs>